Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mass University's Retail Reboot webinar series. This is number six uh, in that series. Today, we're looking at logistics and fulfillment, and we're joined by three people who really know their stuff uh, in those fields. We have Mark Blackburn from uh, Goodman Fielder, previously at the Warehouse Group. Uh, we have Andrew Buxton, uh, who has just set up a, a new, uh, Andrew, they can't see you waving, sorry, mate. Uh, in the recording at least. Uh, live people can see you, recording people can't. Um, uh, Andrew Buxton has set up a, a new uh, uh, organization called BMO, and uh, perhaps you can talk about that, Andrew. And we have Jeff uh, Follerbrecht from Parcel Post. So just some uh, uh, housekeeping. Uh, please stay on mute uh, unless uh, it's your turn to talk. Um, we'll have time at the end for some verbal questions. So if you'd like to ask a question verbally, then uh, you can keep those towards the end. If a question comes to you earlier, um, please do uh, write that up in the chat box and the presenters can see that and, and can address them at the time or in a Q&A session afterwards. Um, the session is being recorded, as you've no doubt heard. And that recording will be processed and put up onto YouTube, and uh, you'll be given the link to the to this recording and to all previous ones uh, in due course. And you can always find them uh, if you've lost the link by googling Mass University and uh, Business Reboot. There's a series of uh, videos there, not just the Retail Reboot series, but some others as well that uh, relate to uh, COVID-19 and uh, how to restart the economy. So thank you for joining us. It'll be uh, a fascinating session and uh, look forward to what uh, Mark, Andrew and Jeff have to say. Mark, we'll start with you. Excellent, well, first challenge is to share the screen. So we'll see if we can do that. And I'm hoping that you can all see that now. Perfect, yep. I just need to hide you so I can see my notes. So thanks Andrew for the introduction. Um, I think first thing is, I wouldn't necessarily say expert, I think I've just been around a long time. Uh, when I sat and I looked through you know, what I've done over my career, I realized that actually I've been around a little bit longer than I thought. Um, within logistics, I'm currently working for Goodman Field I'm the National Logistics Manager. Uh, it is fresh food and covers the whole of New Zealand. So it's it's really fast moving uh, but prior to that i you know i've been in the warehouse group within logistics i was the business transformation lead uh, looking at putting in a new wms system i've also been there group logistics development and support manager um, looking at a number of opportunities and projects within the warehouse group uh, when i first came over to new zealand i went into the warehouse i was the continuous improvement manager and inventory manager for the warehouse and I've got a background in logistics in the UK as well, working for Argos as an operations development manager within logistics and as a supply chain change manager, looking after a number of large um, operations over there in the UK. Um, I've been involved in fulfillment as, as businesses have evolved. So within the warehouse group, I've done quite a bit of work on their fulfillment across all of their brands um, with the warehouse the same. And in the UK, I was involved in the early days with Argos and the Home Retail Group on what now is probably one of the best um, fulfillment models in the UK. Uh, it's a hub and spoke model. It does same day delivery across seven days a week um, and within a really fast turn over time. So if ever you get an opportunity to come and have a look at what the Home Retail Group have done, I would highly recommend it because it's superb. But above all, I'm a retailer. I've been in retail for over 30 years. I've worked for a number of organizations, both at front end, customer facing, and obviously back of house in store operations and logistics channels. Started life working with Asda as, as a fresh food manager, as a provisions manager. And I went into Office World as a store manager and Staples as a store manager. And when I first went over to Argos, I was a store manager. So actually connecting with the customer has been, for me, throughout my career, quite key. In terms of what I want to touch on today is there's a lot, you know, I really want to touch on basics. You know, post-COVID, really what we can't do is lose sight of some of the basics within our supply chain. You know, and within your supply chain, there's things you really need to be considering because it may have changed as you, you know, you've been, if you're an organization or a business that's been closed for a number of weeks, 
there are going to be things that have changed within your supply chain, one of which will be your cash flow, your ability to get up and running. Um, you may have products now that really are seasonal products and are no longer actually relevant. So there are things you need to think about. And um, part of what I want to talk about today is really start to go back and look at your basics because these could make a difference to you if you are an organization or a business that coming out of COVID within New Zealand has left you in a position where you're struggling. Um, and I'll go end to end. So I'll talk about you know, your products, your range, uh, how big an investment, where you're sourcing, what are your domestic logistics looking like, your storage, your handling, your physical footprint, um, who do you use to transport your goods, and what is that cost to deliver? And more importantly, where does the customer sit in all of this? Um, and how are you connecting with your customer? So this is a typical retail supply chain. So apologies if you're a manufacturer and you, you're not a retailer, but typically um, you will see the biggest part of your costs within retail are actually the products that you're selling, that you're purchasing from your suppliers. Um, difficult to control if you're a smaller business, easier to control the larger the organization you become, the more you're able to negotiate with suppliers and get better deals. But as you start to then look at other costs within your end-to-end -end supply chain, typically two to 8% of um, your cost of sale will be the cost of actually getting those goods from the supplier into your organization. Three to 5% of your cost will be storage, holding those goods, transporting those goods to your store. Um, Two to five percent will be actually handling the goods in store and getting them from the back door to the shelf and then three to six percent are actually those opportunity costs where you're not actually um, taking advantage of all the opportunities that are there so this 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 area here probably more difficult for a smaller business to actually challenge and to take advantage of but what you've really got to consider here is these are all your costs tied up to getting the product, shipping the product. It's hard to control. But post-COVID, what, what is the position with your suppliers? What does your supply chain look like? Are there any restrictions in place in any of the countries where you're actually buying your goods? And that's really critical that you understand that. Um, equally, you know, you've got to think about when you, at what point do you take ownership of those goods? When does title transfer? Because there could be some impacts within that. Um, you know, are you buy? Are you is it X works? Are you actually shipping these goods to yourself? If you're operating and buying from, a, I guess China is probably one of our key markets. Um, Title is probably changing as the goods are reaching the ship. Now, if you go back to December, January, there was a lot. The docks, the ports, they all closed down over in China. So there's risk, uh, especially if we in post COVID, if we start to think of what happens if a second wave hits countries. So really examine your supply chains. How robust are they? Um, you know, what are the contingencies if any of your suppliers uh, suddenly can't supply? What's your cost of doing business? And this is where you need to scrutinize your actual costs, look at your P&L in detail and understand where you're spending money. Now I've, you know, I've worked with a number of organizations that, you know, the, when times are good, they don't tend to do this so much. But when times are really challenging, you can drill into this, um, especially when, you know, a lot of businesses here in New Zealand have gone into e-commerce for the first time uh, out of need because you've got to get your goods to your customers. Most stores were shut down other than the large retailers. Um, and a way to trade was actually to get into fulfillment for the first time. But start to look at how you're fulfilling. Do you need the fancy software? Is there a cheaper alternative? Some of the web e-commerce platforms that are out there have some really great plugins um, that can automate data entry, but it comes at a cost. It can be a significant cost. So actually, could the cost of a person doing this be less? Drill into your monthly expenses. I've worked with a couple of smaller businesses where I was asked to advise and you start to look at where their costs go and you find that they're paying a spouse a wage um, as an administrator or a finance assistant, yet they pay for an accountant. You know, if cash flow is a challenge, really get into your costs and understand where your costs are. Um, and look at your logistics in particular around the cost of doing business. You know, and you've got to get into everything. What packaging are you using? I ordered recently online and I ordered three pens and they had turned up in a really nice fancy box. And actually, you got to question um, the retailer that sent those to me. 
because they could have gone in an envelope, which would have been significantly cheaper. So look at the packaging that you're using because there is a cost associated with that. Look at what you're putting inside that packaging. Are you using bubble wrap? Um, bigger retailers in particular get the bubble um, air machines to help to package their products. Now, generally, they provided these free of charge, but they pay for the actual bubble um, wrap that goes in them. It's plastic. So I think first and foremost, it's not great for the environment. But secondly, there is a real cost associated with that, whereas there's cheaper cardboard alternatives that you could be considering. So anyway, I'll come back to costs shortly. And this is the key one. What are your opportunity costs? Now, opportunity costs are around, have you got the product available? Is it on shelf? Can the customer buy it? You know, are you losing sales because um, you're carrying aged inventory and you're having to clear that inventory and reduce it? Um, you know, you can do, there are some real trade-offs. You can build sales by buying more product, putting more product on the shelf, but you're gonna incur um, more costs within clearance. Fulfillment through Amazon is a great example. This is going to increase your cost of doing business, but actually you've got a massive sales potential with Amazon um, because they've got a huge customer base. So who here in New Zealand is doing similar? If you're a smaller business, start to look because I, you know, I know the warehouse, for example, has the marketplace where there's a number of retailers actually using their platform to fulfill goods to customers. And it opens up the your actual amount of customers that you can connect with. So start to look at what could work here in New Zealand um, to help you reach more customers and sell more products. And really drill into, you know, where are your hidden costs? Now, if you're new to fulfillment, you know, where does this cost fit into your model? Because what this model doesn't show is your margin. And somewhere in there, you've got to make a profit. So returns, if you're into fulfillment for the first time, and I'm only touching on these because some of you know, my co-presenters will probably get more into this. Um, you need to factor in the cost of those returns. You've spent all this money pushing it through your end-to-end -end supply chain to get it to the customer. Actually, it could be coming back. And not only is it coming back, you're now handling that product again. You're checking that product again. You're making that product available and putting it back into storage. Returns could be a big cost if you're new to fulfillment. So you've got to examine how that actually fits in with your model. And importantly, if you need to fulfillment, who is doing the fulfillment for you? What is the risk of breakages? Is there any risk of theft? Because literally all of the cost that you've incurred moving those products through your supply chain, you've now lost. So there's, there's things that you need to really drill in and understand as you start to get into fulfillment for the first time. Your team are critical to your success. So labor is one of your largest costs and depending on the size of the operation, you could be really task specific within your labor. It's a multi-skill your team. There's no room to carry costs. Um, and actually this benefits the industry as a whole. So all employees uh, within a small business generally are full service, but if you're a medium business, you know, really start to look at where you're picking, packing and dispatching if there's separate functions, start to see if there's any opportunities to multi-skill your team and, and you know, have them doing all, all of those tasks. And really understand how you're resourced. Are you resourced to meet your demand? Or actually are you over-resourced based on, you know, what your demand is currently? And look at your inventory. If you don't, if you haven't got it, you can't sell it. Equally, why have it if you can't sell it? So be in stock, be price competitive, know what your top sellers are. And it really is that 80-20 rule, which you may or may not be familiar with, but I guarantee you, if you drill into your, what's actually selling, 80% of your products, 20% of your products are 80% of your sales. So really start to examine what isn't selling, um, but make sure, make really certain that your 20% of your products that are selling are always available. You know where they are, they're in stock, you can access them quickly and you can fulfill customer orders. Um, and a larger assortment, it's a great strategy for large retailers, but really start to challenge yourself on, do you actually need that? This really, I'm not gonna really dwell in on this slide. This is really talking about that push-pull strategy on you know, where, what is actually driving your products. Is it you driving the products? Is the organization pushing them to the customer to make them available? So these are your one-offs, your seasonal promotions. Um, it's really about getting that competitive advantage and generating excitement through sales for customers, or are you operating more of a pull strategy where you're, you know, you're driven by the market, 
you've now got to focus on making sure you've got reserve stock available, you can replenish quickly, and really understand what the lag are. So look at your critical, um, your critical touch points within there. So it's replenishment availability and actually those lead times. And if you're new to fulfillment, don't be afraid because you know, we've gone into a post-COVID world uh, and you'll hear lots of buzzwords like omnichannel. Um, omnichannel, I would challenge retailers here in New Zealand to actually say there isn't many that are truly omnichannel right now. Um, so look at, you know, don't be afraid going into fulfillment for the first time. Don't be afraid going into new channels, but keep it simple. You know, are you a single channel, which is great because then it's all about getting it into the store and making it available. Are you multi-channel? So multi-channel, uh, you know, you ring fence some stock, you're gonna provide that stock to customers online, probably the simplest way of getting into online, but really for small medium operators in the, going into this in the first instance, I'd challenge you to become cross-channel because actually you don't want to invest more in stock and product. You want to keep that investment as tight as you can. Um, and this is the simplest version. And actually, this is probably where most retailers are operating here in New Zealand right now. Service is your competitive advantage. Really focus on service. You know, look at your shipping and your customer lead times. Do you control this or are you handing it over to a third party provider? And how are they operating post COVID? Supply chains right now are running really slow here in New Zealand. You know, Auckland to Dineen used to take three days. It's now up to two weeks. Um, two weeks to the US is now up to four weeks. So look at where your customers are, but really understand what your custom promise is. How transparent are you? If you're telling them two to three days and it's two weeks, I guarantee you that is not great service from a customer perspective. And you're actually going to lose those customers to someone who tells the customers it's going to be 10 days. Because managing customer expectations is going to be critical. So look at your alternatives. There's others, there's FedEx, there's UPS, but they're more expensive. So how are you going to manage those costs? What's going to be the impact on margin? And if you're a shop, look at your opening hours. You know, where's the bulk of your trade? How much, you know, if you're open until 10 o'clock at night, between eight o'clock at night and 10 o'clock at night, how much are you actually making? And is it worth it when you consider the wages and the lighting and the heating, et cetera, that you're spending? So look at the way your customers are uh, actually, the majority of your customers are coming in and shopping. And be ruthless with waste. We're a throwaway society, but this is no excuse to throw away profit. So look at where you position your people and your inventory. Uh, is there a lot of excess movement between one process and another? If you're operating out the back of a shop and you're doing fulfillment out the back of a shop, put some product there so that it's quickly available, particularly those 20% of products that are selling quickly. Um, how much stock should you hold? You know, if it's raw materials, if you're manufacturing, make sure that what you've got doesn't exceed what you actually need. Look at your lead time for replenishments. Do you understand what your stock turn is and how quickly you're moving your stock through your business? Uh, fresh food turns really quickly. Whoops, I'm sorry, I've just scrolled my mouse. Um, how quickly do your team complete their tasks? Look at where the thing, you know, look, look at, how they're operating. I've seen businesses where they dispatch product on the back door, they print the dispatch documentation in an office that's significantly away from where um, the tasks are being completed. And when you boil it down and you look at the costs involved in that, actually it's costing you three full timers over the course of a year. Um, how much time are they waiting? Waiting time is a killer. I've seen it here in New Zealand where people just wait, stood at the back dock waiting for a delivery to arrive. What else could they be doing? Are you manufacturing too much? And how big a problem are damages and defects? I'm looking at my time, so I'm actually skipping through this quite quickly. Um, but food for thought, and this is really around what is your supply chain post-COVID? And are you fit for a post-COVID future? So in the short term, get to know your customer base. Make sure you've got the right resources. And actually validate your supplier base's operational. Look at your contingencies. Look at where you're taking ownership of your products. These are things you can, you can change quite quickly. In the medium term, rationalize those SKUs that aren't selling. Kill that long tail. You really, really don't need to carry the inventory that's not gonna move right now, if that's not what your customer proposition is about. Review your service agreements. Um, change if you, you know, if you can. You may have repair and maintenance agreements that you know, have come up for renewal and you can look at who else could provide the service. And look at your freight costs. And in the long term, get your footprint right. Scale and cost are critical within this. 
Uh, and actually, this depends on how big an organization are, how many hubs, how many warehouses, DCs, you know, do you own them, do you lease them? And one thing in New Zealand that I found is New Zealand leases all contain ratchet clauses. They only ever go up. So don't be afraid to actually now go and talk to these landlords because um, they don't want you to move any more than you want to move right now. So be prepared to negotiate and be prepared to move if need be. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Thank you, Mark. So, Mark, you uh, talked about out of stock um, as one of the, the critical issues, um, uh, balancing with, uh, with inventory. Um, how do small retailers manage that, given the disruption that we've been seeing in the supply chain? Should they be over-ordering in the expectation that uh, disruption is likely to continue? Or do they try and minimize that orders uh, to minimize any waste uh, or, or, uh, or being left with, uh, with stock that won't sell? Uh, it's always a challenge, of course, for retailers of any size. But right now, for small retailers, I think a particularly pressing problem. I think the, the challenge for small retailers will be in the minimum order quantities. Now, you know, we're in a very different business environment than we were before we were before everybody got into the COVID-19 situation, suppliers as well as retailers. So don't be afraid now to go and talk to those suppliers to see if you can reduce those MOQs so that you've not got such a big investment in stock. I think the key thing with your out of stocks is the lead time, what the lag time is. Um, if you're purchasing from a wholesaler or a supplier here in New Zealand, actually that could be quite a short period of time. If you can reduce those MOQs, then I would say order little and often um, so that you're moving it through quickly um, and you know, you're meeting the sales expectations of the customers. The key thing is looking at what buffer, you, buffer stock you need dependent on what that lag time is, because you really need to make sure that you don't, you know, certainly if it's a continuity product, these are products that your customers expect to be able to buy from you. Um, this is why they've come and, and actually come and visited you because you know, these are the products they know you will sell. Do not be out of stock of those products. And if that means, you know, from a smaller retailer perspective, invest more in the 20% of products that are giving you 80% of your sales and actually start to drop off the costs within the tail and accept some out of stocks within those areas, then you will actually protect yourself as a, as a business right now where cash flow is critical. And I think they're the things people need to think about. If you try to be all things to all people and keep everything in stock, um, I think in the world that we're in right now, you're, you're going to hemorrhage cost because every skew that you bring through your organization is going to cost you money. You've got to bring, you've got to buy it. You've got to bring it in. You've got to handle it. You've got to store it somewhere. Then you've got to replenish your shelf all before you actually get to sell that product and all of that costs. So you've got to really start to, to think about where, where your costs are and how you can actually reduce them. And this applies to large retailers as well. I mean, some of the large retailers carry a really long tail that costs money. And I would say in the world that we're in now, rationalizing your products and rationalizing your SKU base is probably one of the biggest things that most organizations need to look to do right now. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So we have a, a question in the chat box from um, Amelia who asks, is it easier to start uh, retail now? And I think she means a, a new retail business or perhaps a new retail product line rather than adjust and reorganize everything to meet the new reality. Um, the question about starting a new business, I think I might direct to Andrew and, and perhaps you might uh, answer this at the end of your talk, Andrew, because you have just done this yourself, started a, a new retail business. So uh, Andrew Buxton, um, previously with Eastar Group and before that the warehouse in a number of uh, different iterations, uh, now with a startup organization called BMO. Um, Andrew. Hi, uh, good morning. I, um, I, I, I will focus on uh, smaller retail than bigger retail, but I might use some examples from big retail. Um, yeah, just just really briefly, my background. I, I've I've worked in. I've been lucky enough to work in big retailers, um, Debenhams, Arcadia in the UK many years ago. Uh, with Eastar, I was the CEO of Eastar, an e-commerce business. We worked with the likes of David Jones and Country Road. I've also been at the warehouse a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> I've run supply chain there twice, sourcing IT. I was the CEO of multi-channel for a while, so CEO of Torpedo 7 Group. Um, and I've also 
been lucky enough, and I think it probably gives me the perspective to work in small retail as well. So I've worked with a few startups. I've had my own startups, run my own business from scratch, just about uh, run some businesses that have been sold for, uh, you know, eight figures and done well and other businesses that have been sold for $3.37 and not done so well. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a, a background that hopefully gives me a different perspective. I, I guess the difference for me personally between big retail and uh, small retail is that in big retail, I had some hair and in small retail, very little. Um, I always start with that. The, um, what, what I wanted to talk about, retail during COVID, uh, very briefly, my view on that is that what's happened in New Zealand is, is uh, the demand disappeared, obviously, in level three and four and, and shops were closed and digital took off. And I've talked to a lot of people in recent times, I'm doing some consulting with some as well, on uh, on starting up their own digital business or getting that to a point that's actually uh, uh, sensible now. Finally, some of those old retailers who thought it was just an aside have realized that it's a core part of the business. What's happened since level two, you know, everybody wanted to go back to the shops and back to the malls and store sales have gone up, depending on who you talk to, 30%, 50%, 70%. Store sales have bounced and digital dropped off in the last couple of weeks, I think, for a lot of people. I, I, the real question is what happens after that? Uh, and I think um, what, what's going to happen is that demand will be lower. Um, sorry. I don't know how to go back. I want that. Demand will be lower uh, for a period uh, with, with people unemployed and the rest. I think also you'll find a lot of retailers do a lot of restructuring and resizing of networks, uh, whether that means something they should have done over the past five years are now going to come out and do it through this process and finally that digital will grow as a percentage total um really briefly on background i, I think uh there's a really good book it's quite old now probably about 15 years old uh winning at retail and it's something that i've used throughout my career that i think is really helpful for thinking about things i've sat in too many retail exec meetings where we want to be the cheapest the biggest the fastest the hardest the most fashionable, we want to be everything to everybody. I think in retail, what you've got to understand is that you've got to be the best at something and you can't be the best at everything. You know, um, if you're talking about marketing, it's what's your unique value proposition. Um, and I think what that's relevant to is small business more than big business as well. I'm also going to use, I'm a great fan of people have heard me talk before is I'm a big fan of, uh, Tesco and the Terry Lee who did exactly that they knew what they were about they focused on keeping things simple and through his uh, 14 years they they started with a similar market share to Sainsbury's in the UK and ended up being twice the size of them uh, and throughout that they they smashed them on a whole bunch of different levels and the biggest thing I learned out of that was was the focus on simplicity uh, and I think that's really relevant for supply chain as well. A lot of supply chain stuff gets too complicated too quickly. Uh, and in reality, a lot of it is, is process. So in, in Tesco, the focus was better, simpler, cheaper. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, and I'm just going to focus on digital fulfillment. I could talk about lots of other things, but uh, from a supply chain perspective, I, I want to talk about digital fulfillment as it applies to a smaller business. Um, since I um, decided I was taking summer off and finished my corporate stuff, I've been doing some consulting, but I also set up my own business. We sell vitamins and uh, supplements online, a business called BMO. And uh, that's, that's been really good learning for me. And probably some of that I'll, I'll allude to as well. So digital fulfillment. Why is, why is supply chain important and digital? I, I, the largest issue... Um, with digital from most customers is usually fulfillment. Whereas in the old days, we used to have our story about taking a product back to a uh, retailer and, and uh, having a quality problem. Usually somebody's got a story of how they ordered something now and it took three weeks to get here, that arrived damaged, that they had a problem returning it and all the rest. It's usually a fulfillment issue that, that, that people talk about. Uh, the biggest common question in digital is where's my stuff? If you look at any customer service, 
data for any retailer, pretty much the biggest question they get is where is it? Uh, and I think also on a positive side, fulfillment's at the heart of the digital connection with a customer. I, I always thought Apple were really good at that with their packaging and their opening, you know, the unboxing process was amazing. You know, like it made you feel special. You know, it's that bit, if you're selling online, then the bit where you physically connect with the customer is, is when they receive the package really. So I, I guess the tie it back. How do we do film, fulfillment better, simpler and cheaper than retailers who may be much, much bigger than, than what we are and, and where can we win? So talking about that, um, to do it better, I, I, and I'll use some examples, is really, being fast is important. But big retailers are actually really bad at fast delivery in general. Uh, you know, they have, they have shifts, they have uh, processes, they have backlogs, they, they, they are not really that focused on fast. I think as a smaller retailer, you can pick your orders out of hours, you can pick your orders at night, uh, you, you can know who your courier driver is and getting to turn up. Uh, you know, you can focus on 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 speed as a as a competitor advantage. Um, I think also as well, some people have used it for connecting with customers. If you've got a business in Auckland, you know, occasionally take the time to actually go and deliver the orders yourself and knock on customers' doors. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it, it's actually about connection and being different. It leads into the second thing: how can you be better? Be friendly. Uh, packaging and, and and I'll talk to that as well being friendly handwrite cards you know use the customer's name that's things that the warehouse is not going to do it's the briscoes is not going to do but as a smaller retailer you can uh, make it personal if the person ordered before say thanks for this order we know that you ordered this before it's like using the information and knowing the customer people want that connection and as a small business it gives you the opportunity to do that. Uh, packaging, uh, talked about Apple. I, I think I think you need it to be appropriate and differentiate. You know, like if you sell high value items or um, uh, items like that, package it well, you know, wrap a bow on it. You know, like uh, Strawberry Net used to be really good at this. They've got a terrible website. They delivered cosmetics from Hong Kong. But when you got the delivery, it was delightful to open you know with the bow and everything else you know it's that it's that and branding that that uh that process is really good it's an advantage you can potentially have over others um surprise and delight i mean everybody loves free at warehouse stationery when i worked there uh we used to give away gifts because we realized that the people who were doing the ordering were the pas usually and so the PA always got a gift. If they had a choice between us and Office Max, then actually they got a gift from stationery. Uh, free is always good. Shotgun Supplements, another business that I ran for a while as part of the warehouse. Uh, we bought shakers from China. Uh, we sold 2,000 to pay for them and gave away the other 8,000 that we bought as free gifts. People love free gifts and connection. Uh, the last one, I guess, on the doing it better is I'm a big believer in using a store network. If you have one, uh, click and collect is 30 to 50% of online sales these days. You know, you have to use what you have. Um, one of the clients of eStar, a plus size apparel retailer uh, across Australia and New Zealand, used to get 30 to 50%, 30% uplift, 30% uplift on their online click and collect orders basically because the people in store knew that people were coming in, they knew what size they were, they knew what they'd ordered. They actually went through the orders before the person came to collect them and then, you know, and then upsell and cross-sell. It was a kind of environment that made sense for that. So I think, I think all that about doing it better, if you're a small business, you can't be cheaper. Um, and I, I talk about that, about that later. You can't be cheaper than some big retailers, but you can be better. And it's understanding where you can be better and connection with customer is really a big part of that, I think. The second thing I guess uh, was about how do you do it simpler? You know, um, a lot of digital businesses and a lot of online businesses, uh, the shipping uh, part is, is hidden on the website on a lot of retailers still. 
you need to make it simple to understand. You make it clear from the start. Um, you know, there's no point in getting to a checkout. The biggest cause of abandoned checkouts is finding out what the freight cost is. You know, there's no point in getting to the end of a process of, of buying to find out that you're paying $20 to deliver to your rural address just outside Auckland, which doesn't make any sense. The other thing I hear a lot from retailers is they want to work out the profitability of freight. I, I've, I've never understood that really in, in all my time. You know, like uh, freight charges to customer should be simple. If you're making 40% margin on a $100 order, you're making $40. Does it matter whether you're losing $1.50 on the shipment? Um, it doesn't. It's not what you do in store. You don't say, well, actually, I'm not going to sell that to you. I don't really want to sell it because it doesn't cover the checkout operator's wages or the portion of the lease cost. It's a weird way of looking at, uh, at shipping costs, I think, for digital. Uh, other things about keeping it simple, uh, digital fulfillment, it is about process. Even in a very basic business, it's important to measure, measure lead times. Uh, I'm, I'm always surprised by the number of people who don't know how many, how many, what percentage of orders are taking longer than their stated lead times. If you ask most retailers, they'll tell you our lead times are three to five days or five to seven days. And then you ask them, well, what percentage are longer than five days? They, they really don't know. I mean, it's important to know that. It's important to know how, what your picking results are and how productivity is. It's important to know what short picks uh, that you have and where you're missing out. Um, fulfillment locations, uh, again, it depends on what size of retailer you are. Pretty much in New Zealand, nobody is big enough to not be picking from store rather than a distribution center. And I'll, I'll say that with some caveats. If you, if you pick from your distribution center for online and you're doing $150 million a year, it might make sense to do it from a distribution center. Uh, pretty much nobody is doing that in, the, in New Zealand. If you pick from your distribution center and you're already picking units, and you're already uh, shipping all over the world, uh, and you have the full range, and you don't have a lot of seasonal, it may make sense. But pretty much for everybody, store fulfillment or fulfillment from the location that you have the stock in makes most sense. Uh, even for Briscoe's, even for the warehouse, I know the warehouse changed from store fulfillment back to the DC and it was a bit of a disaster. Uh, Briscoe's do it from 11 stores around the country. You know. Uh, fulfillment from store is very, very key. Um, other things in the keeping it simple, I think, is uh, using an example. I won't talk about picking, but uh, communication with customers is important and managing expectations. Another thing we did extremely well at Warehouse Stationery was we told people that the delivery lead time was three days, and then we pretty much smashed that because we were doing store fulfillment from four stores around the country. What, what that did is we had loads of positive feedback about how fast our delivery process was and how great it was and how amazing it was, rather than, um, I, use an, I can't give the real data, but I know the iconic in Australia quotes a lot of next day delivery, but I know that they fail on greater than 10% of occasions. Uh, yeah, it's not very well reported. I, I think the key is, communicating with customers on expectations and managing those expectations and following up with it well. Uh, the other thing in there about keeping it simple is managing exceptions and managing with data. Uh, most of the delays and most of the issues with digital fulfillment are usually from short picks or most of the problems are from split orders. Um, when I ran multi-channel at the warehouse, the way I used to get the number of back orders down the best way that I could do that was send out an email to the regional managers and the store managers and suddenly they found the stock in the store and, uh, and the back orders went down, which was <laughs> quite ridiculous. Uh, but I think in reality, it's having a simple process for that. You know, if you have seven items in an order and you're missing one $10 pen or consumable item, you know, it's better to ship that without the item and tell the customer than to wait and make them wait for days. So having a simple process around that is really key. Um, so that's better and simpler and, and some sort of tips, if you like, on that. 
cheaper can can you be cheaper uh, than than a big retailer i think i think the answer is no you can't uh, i've spoke to a lot of home retailers who talk about kmart and they did a great job on their homewares K- kmart's selling homewares at 50 percent margin cheaper than most people can source that you know you're not gonna get a lower courier rate than the warehouse crew you know i mean their, their rates are obscene you're not going to be able to ship cheaper than that I, th- I think what you have to do is you have to win elsewhere you know you have to win on being better you have to win on being closer to customers and that doesn't mean that you don't look for efficiencies um one of the biggest is and we used to talk about it a lot was sweating assets so don't build a DC if you're a hundred million dollar retailer or allocate twenty five percent of your distribution center to do online fulfillment that might be eight percent of your business if you can use the store network, sweat the store network, you know, look for stores that may be doing smaller sales in the right regions with a process oriented manager and a big stock room. Um, other things look for collaboration and aggregation opportunities. Um, you will not get better freight rates going direct to couriers, but you will, if you go to an aggregator, you know, parcel wings or parcel port, just to be happy with that, uh, you know, they, they will get you better rates than going direct up to quite a scale, I think, for retailer. And look, look for simple efficiencies on the process as well. How do you save time? How do you save effort in that process? Cool. So, um, yeah, just really focused on, on uh, digital fulfillment and, and what maybe you can do uh, on a practical basis going forward and how to be better, be better on the things, be simpler, and do the things the way you can win. You know, fast, friendly, delight, customer intimacy. You know, keep things simple. That's, you know, uh, complex is the enemy of good. Uh, and try and get cheaper, but you're not going to be the cheapest. So, you know, and that's where you'll win on a long-term basis. Cool. That's all I wanted to cover. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, so there are a number of questions in the chat room, which I'll ask both Mark and uh, Andrew to take a look at and figure out which of the two of you may uh, may address those. Um, Andrew, you you mentioned aggregation uh, in the end, and that is indeed the uh, the, the topic for our third speaker, uh, Jeff Ollebrecht. So, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Andrew, and uh, thanks, Andy, for the plug. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, um, I'm, uh, I'm Monica Jeff Ollebrecht. I'm the, uh, the CEO of Parcelport. Um, we are a, uh, a freight aggregator. So we, um, um, yeah, so we, we basically, we brief off the uh, major players such as uh, Freightways, uh, New Zealand Post, uh, TIL, FedEx, TNT, and we pass on those savings. Uh, we Big volume discounts, we pass on those savings back to uh, SMEs primarily. Um, so I'm currently uh, CEO of Parcel Port. They're a small Kiwi uh, startup, uh, been around for about four or five years. And um, but uh, previous to that, I was with uh, with the DHL group, uh, DHL and Kern and Argyle. It's been about 15 years uh, overseas, uh, primarily in Asia Pacific and Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, and also uh, US and uh, spent some time in Russia as well, doing uh, various parts of the DHL business uh, in DHL Express. Uh, in supply chain, so warehousing and 3PL, uh, as well as DHL Global Forwarding. So quite a varied career in that logistics business. Uh, and I guess one of the interesting things um, uh, from the DHL Express days in about 2011, 2012, I, I was starting up the, well, what was primarily the startup for DHL and e-commerce. Um, and uh, we had a bit, of a bit of a footprint there, but we were really working on um, uh, a major customer at the time, or the biggest customer at the time, was eBay, who were doing like 160 million shipments a year um, from China into the, into the US alone, just at one trade lane. And um, it was a, uh, a challenging business to try and break into, um, and primarily for DHL, because we didn't really have the footprint on the ground. Uh, we, had, uh, we had, it was no problem getting the product from China to the US, uh, but that final mile, that last, uh, leg of the shipment was a was a real challenge because we're up against them FedEx and UPS and they're a, a big ground network in the US of course so DHL wasn't quite as big so what I'm really sort of going to just touch on today um, is talk about final mile 
uh, and also uh, going international. Um, just an observation, and I saw this uh, I saw this a few days ago. I thought I'd just include it now. I mean, there's plenty of talk about COVID and, and uh, the impact on uh, uh, on businesses, particularly. And I know there's going to be a lot of uh, um, uh, businesses that are going to do it tough right now, and uh, and some businesses aren't going to survive. Um, however, um, with with crisis brings opportunity. It brings opportunity for uh, for small and medium sized retailers, and of course, larger retailers. To look at that uh, that cross-channel and omni-channel opportunities, and really develop and commit into um, their e-commerce platforms, and having a good, strong online presence, um, that will be the future of, uh, of of retail, and the future of business B two B and B two C. Um, but I think the the key words there were the last two words there, and the last last bullet point there, driven by the ease and safety of digital shopping, which we all uh, are comfortable with now, but as well as improved experiences. Uh, and the customer experience is something I really want to just touch on here. Um, so why you should care about Final Mile? Um, and I think the big point here is that 83% of consumers think that brands don't care about the, uh, the experience after checkout. Um, and, uh, and there's a fair amount on 39%, according to Magento and Parcel Perform, uh, say negative delivery experience will stop them from returning. So that's uh, reason enough to really start thinking about Final Mile and what does it mean? So what is final mile? It's a, it's a logistics term uh, for those who don't know, final, final mile, last mile. It's that last physical step of the e-com sale. Um, I put a little uh, waiver at the end there saying sometimes because um, the, if, uh, it may not be the, the final physical step because sometimes there are returns. Um, potentially the most challenging and time consuming part of the sales process. Um, it, it's, it's really because I think what Andy touched on it before is that the, the big question people come back with is, you know, where's my product? That's what customers are always at. Where's my product? They want to know where it is. And it's a real key to customer satisfaction and dissatisfaction. Um, I'm sure we've all, um, or many of us, have ordered product recently um, and been, uh, been struck with how long it's taken for products to get down, either internationally, uh, coming into New Zealand, or just domestically in New Zealand. Um, you know, 10 days across Auckland uh, a week ago uh, was, uh, was not unusual. Um, so, but it, that can either sort of bring people towards uh, e-com and buying online or drive them away from it. Um, and so what's the problem with it? What's, why, why, what's the challenge in e-commerce, right? Efficiency, inefficiency is a big one, right? If you think about uh, the career drivers, for example, uh, they're operating, they've got multiple stops, and they've got low drop sizes. So they might be shipping one or two parcels to an address. And you can imagine if that's a rural in the country, um, they're doing a drop off up a driveway to a, to, a, to a house or a farm. And it's one, one parcel, and then they've got to drive you know, three or four miles down the road uh, and drop off another parcel. Um, so there's a lot of inefficiencies it, within the city as well, right? Uh, I've got to go to level 14 of uh, you know, Colorado Towers. Uh, and then the next drop off is at number 12, Pitt Street, uh, upstairs in the office. And, and these are one single parcel sometimes. So there's a lot of inefficiencies. That's compounded by the volumes. Um, you know, e-commerce is growing as a, as a business. Um, and, uh, you know, B2C is particularly growing. We know for COVID that the increases that uh, we're seeing at um, New Zealand Post uh, was mentioning about their, um, uh, their increase being from... Um, uh, from 300,000 parcels in one day, which was, I think, Black Friday last year or, or towards Christmas last year, they went from 300,000 parcels to 500,000 in day two of level, level three. Um, so that's a huge, huge increase. Uh, and that adds to uh, the, the problems of inefficiency. Customer ex expectations, they want it fast. They want it convenient. They don't want that little, little card in the letterbox or that card is stuck in the door saying, we missed you and you weren't home. You know, I was, I was home all morning, but I didn't hear the knock. Um, and, and they also sometimes want it free. Um, and then, of course, a lack of supply of focus and attention, right? Because it's, uh, you know, it's often like, well, the goods are sold, bam, the, the, the stickers on the parcel, that's it, it's fine, it's going to the customer. And it's really just, you know, give it to the courier, and that's the final mile. So I guess a couple of points, and I think the first one is to use your information to make business more appealing to all customers. Um, Provide better delivery options. Um, so I'd say, firstly, take control. 
Uh, talk with your freight partner, talk with their customer service department, talk with your account management if, you, if you've got an account manager, uh, talk to the courier drivers, find out what's the best time of day to, you know, for you and for the driver. Um, work that relationship. Sometimes the courier driver will give you their mobile phone number or in cases of emergencies or whatever, but just form those relationships with your freight partners. Um, utilize your data. Um, what's your on-time delivery uh, uh, timing? Uh, how many claims? If your OTD is like five days on average, you probably want to look at that because you want, that means some of your shipments are going in over a week um, are getting to the customer. Um, you know, those sort of things. You really need to look at your data and utilize the, uh, the information. Make smarter decisions to, you know, reduce the cost where you can and add velocity to your supply chain. So things like, um, you know, the, the size of my uh, size of my shipping containers. Is, is the box I'm shipping it in, um, is it too big for the goods inside the box? Does that cause damages because the, the product is, is bouncing around too much inside the package? But also, am I shipping air? Um, you know, one of the things in, in logistics and freight, you don't want to be shipping air, right? So if you've got a nice, a no, nice tight, uh, you know, packaging around your box that protects your product, fantastic. And make that delivery experience your competitive edge. You know, if you've got a, <coughs> a variety of delivery options, um, are you offering an easy return solution? Returns is a big thing for, uh, for customers. If they, they feel comfortable that, you know, the product doesn't fit or they don't like it, they can send it back. Uh, it just makes things a lot more comfortable. LL Bean in the US, I don't know if you know the company LL Bean in the US, large hunting and fishing um, uh, company in the US, had a policy of whenever you bought the product, it could have been 30 years ago, uh, they would offer you a 100% guarantee on that product. Uh, and you could return it for a, for a full price guarantee. It was quite a, uh, quite a statement, uh, and they gained a lot of business, a lot of followers for that, and a lot of uh, loyalty. Um, second point, everybody likes to be in the know, uh, including your customers. Um, and here's some, uh, some information about uh, updates, you know, tra uh, track and trace delivery status. Um, so 93% expect to receive proactive updates uh, and 90% track the delivery status. <coughs> Excuse me. So don't leave your customers in the dark. Proactively send delivery updates to your customers. Um, you know, your aggregator may do that for you uh, and provide those for you. So it goes to text or email. Um, keep your customers engaged and use those touch point opportunities. There's, there's at least four opportunities within that delivery cycle um, uh, to contact customers and let them know that, hey, you haven't, it's not that you've sold the product and you're not gonna see them again. It's like, hey, we're just making sure that you get this on time and you're happy with the service. So things like your order's on its way or, uh, you know, what do you think of your product you've just received? Or, you know, as a, as a thank you for ordering, here's a special offer, right? Use those touch points wherever you can. Um, number three, don't leave this opportunity to impress in the hands of someone you don't trust. Um, you know, there's a, there's a figure, 20% of consumers blame the retailer for the poor experience, regardless who, sh who delivers the product. Um, that's a, uh, those are important things, right? So choose your partner wisely. Get referrals if you can. Uh, go to someone, uh, you know, who's in, in business as well. See if you can get referrals about who to use. Are they cost effective? Are you getting the best deal? Because... Uh, as Andy said, you know, if you're going straight to the big providers, you often won't get this, the, the rates that you could get when you go to someone who's an aggregator, for example. Um, cover, coverage of your customer base. Do they cover your customer base? Uh, do they do international? Do they do, uh, you know, top to bottom New Zealand, uh, et cetera? <coughs> Chatham Islands, Waiheke Island, et cetera. Do they integrate with your marketplace, whether it be Shopify or WooCommerce or whoever, or TradeMe, uh, or your online website? Uh, track and trace technology, very important to have that track and trace technology and great, have they got great customer service and have you got a strong working relationship with them? Um, that's, that's, that's all I'll do on very high level on final mile and very, very quick. I want to talk about international um, and, um, you know, the world is buying. The ability to make your product visible internationally is the jewel and the crown of the world, in the world of e-commerce. Um, just expanding your reach and expanding your product's ability to reach more people in a bigger market um, is, is, is fantastic if you can do it. So it just it said expand your horizons and your growth opportunities. I put this little chart in here because I've used this a number of times because I think it's very telling and I think it says a couple of things. Obviously, the growth of e-commerce over, um, uh, over a number of years and a, a number of emerging economies, um, Indonesia, they're significant. 
a, a huge opportunity. And it's really about the access to these countries, the people in these countries have to mobile technology <coughs> and their opportunity to, to use mobile technology to buy online. Uh, so um, so the, the biggest barriers to international trade and, the, and looking through the eyes of, of an SME, and, I, and, and I've, I've been there myself, um, is obviously cost, uh, you know, all the extra costs that are going to be involved, um, focusing on priorities other than international sales growth. And I think the biggest one is the fear of the unknown. Um, if I start advertising my product in Australia, for example, what's the growth of the market going to be? What, what's all the, the difficulties? What about uh, tax and those sort of things? So you really want to take a lot of those pressures off yourself uh, and talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Um, and there are successful international trades about overcoming those barriers for the buyer so that buying is easy, right? So someone can buy from wherever in the world they are. They can buy any product and there are less barriers for them to receive that product. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'd say um, priorities, right? Do your research. Uh, understand the online buying behavior of foreign consumers in target countries. Some countries may not be appropriate for your products. Uh, they may not be appropriate for, uh, for online e-commerce. Um, but do, do the research. Understand the buying behavior. Promotion, marketing, and payment methods must be considered and locally adapted. Um, not every country has... Um, you know, has Afterpay or has, um, you know, will take to your marketing campaign in New Zealand, for example, may not be applicable in, in another country, Australia, for example. Um, you know, too many Kiwi references, Kiwi references may not go that well in Australia. Um, observe the local product and cultural trends to learn which markets will bring you the best value. Some markets, some, some countries may be, <coughs> may be trending culturally in your particular product area. Um, you know, those sort of things, well, I can target, you know, I can target Vietnam, for example, because they really like the products that I'm, that I'm selling. Um, and also understand tax implications. Uh, understand um, de minimis is, is the level where uh, in a country, uh, you, if you fall under de minimis le uh, levels, you don't pay, the, the customer doesn't pay tax and duties. So if you can get into that country with that, those tax implications, fantastic. If there are tax implications, should consider doing DDP. Excuse me, sorry. That's bad. <clears throat> you should consider doing DDP, which is du deliver duty pay prepaid. So the, the customer doesn't have any hassles with products getting stuck at customs and getting phone calls from, from you know, freight forwarders and brokers. Um, consider the freight implications. <coughs> Understand what items are easy to ship to avoid shipping issues. And I put it primarily robust versus fragile items. You think about what, you, what your product goes through in the domestic cycle when you're shipping domestically, even across town. Well, you can compound that when it goes internationally. So make sure your product's, you know, protected. And, and, and you know, shipping fragile items can be very difficult. Lithium batteries can be a bit of a problem if without the right documentation. Can all be done. Just you've got to be mindful of, you know, how to package and how to prepare the goods. Um, higher value and higher value smaller items. Uh, what we call the holy grail for international econ. Um, you know, the higher the value and the smaller the item means you've got less freight component in your total cost of goods. That, that's, that's gold for a customer buying in a foreign country. Um, <clears throat> and know your product. I, I mentioned before about domestic market. Know, cut your teeth in the domestic market. Find out what your, what your issues could be with your product. Could there be returns with your product? It's a lot, e a lot harder to get product back from an international country than getting it back from across town. So, <clears throat> know your product, learn your, learn your business in the domestic market, and then go international. Um, consider staging and market. Sea Freight plus 3PL Warehouse in the UK, for example, versus Express or just Air Freight into that country. There's a cost-reward benefit there as well. Um, I'm working with a company right now who who's, uh, brings product in from China, brings it into uh, New Zealand. Um, we've worked with them on uh, putting together a 3PL warehouse in Australia. So he gets the product shipped from China to Australia now, distributes out of, out of Australia. And now he's looking at breaking to the UK with the same product range. So we're working with him on a 3PL warehouse in London uh, to supply the UK market. That is far more cost effective than shipping from China down to New Zealand and back in, and also shipping direct the individual products into the UK from China. Choose your partner wisely. As the previous points, 
plus in knowledge and capability in international freight. This can be made so much easier if you've got a partner who knows what they're doing uh, and, can, uh, and can assist your business correctly. So um, it's a, that knowledge and capability in international freight is, is pretty key. So, uh, yeah, final word, um, I'm just careful of time, but um, along with price range, convenience, great service is one of the keys, right? Understand your customer's experience with your company. Understand what it is to be a customer, what your expectations are. Whatever it is you're buying or whatever, whatever service you're looking for, understand what it is to be a customer and adapt your company accordingly. And find ways to make your company's, your company's customer experience as good as it can be. I believe that's it from me. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jeff. If you wouldn't mind just yep, turning off your slide sheet. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much. I am conscious of the time. It's uh, just gone uh, 12 o'clock and I know we, uh, we said that we would take this from 11 to 12. Um, so I'm just going to show this slide and talk about it briefly and then I'll uh, open the, the floor for questions. Uh, for those who wish to stay on and for the three presenters, if you're able to do so, that would be awesome. There's no need to, to curtail this uh, if, if we don't have to. Um, so just a way of, of thanking all three uh, for your fantastic insights and, and actually very well meshed together. It's almost as if we'd planned this. It was uh, wonderful. Um, I do uh, want to um, uh, just bring next week's uh, webinar um, to the fore. So next week we look at employment, uh, employment law, health and safety implications, and how to manage uh, people performance in, uh, in the current retail uh, and, and small uh, enterprise environment. So we have uh, two speakers to talk about that. One's an employment lawyer uh, and the other is an, um, uh, a performance consultant. Uh, and, and both will have some fascinating things to say. So same, uh, same place, Zoom, of course. Uh, same time next week, uh, you can find the registration link uh, on the Massey uh, Business Reboot page and uh, also in uh, emails that will go out for those who uh, registered for today and in, in previous webinars as well. So just bring that to your attention. Um, so thank you all three for your, uh, your uh, comments today. Jeff, I want to um, ask a couple of questions for you and ask all three of you to uh, take a look at the chat because there are a number of questions there too. Uh, Jeff, my question for you is about returns. Um, and partly this is personal experience. Uh, I've ordered items uh, sent from overseas. They've had aggregators or large scale shipments. They could afford to ship the product to me very cheaply. But if I need to return it, uh, it costs me an absolute fortune. And I'm thinking in particular of say, um, Book Depository, which has free shipping of books out of Australia or the UK, uh, but not free shipping returns. And Marks and Spencer, um, I get a, lot, a number of my clothes from Marks and Spencer, uh, which both Mark and Andrew as Brits will uh, be quite familiar with, I'm sure. Um, and again, I can order a pair of jeans very cheaply out of the UK, but it can cost me 30 to $40 to return that item back. And clearly I'm not going to want to do that very often. Um, what, what are the tricks for both customers and retailers to know how to manage international returns in particular? Right. Um, I, I think there's, uh, well, the first, the first thing is to sort of, is to uh, qualify the returns program with your, um, uh, with your supplier. <coughs> um, a lot of the, the bigger, bigger suppliers um, will have warehousing or 3PLs in the local countries uh, and arrange for, uh, for products to go back into country to a warehouse uh, and they will see freight and air freight those products back and provide you with the guarantee that way warranty so you don't have that big international sort of component going back because as you say it is very heavy um, we do that with a, a couple of companies in Australia uh, and have a 3PL set up in Australia for them to manage their returns so the returns go back from uh, the uh, the metro city in Australia or wherever they are in Australia to a 3PL there they don't come all the way back to New Zealand um, a lot of companies will provide free freight back to New Zealand uh, or whichever country it is uh, and that's, that's great if you can get it. Uh, I work with net who are uh, who are high value items. They, they're common, they're, the, the common purchasing thing was uh, people would buy two or three products because they were so expensive and then try, you know, try one on and the, you know, the right size, say they were shoes or jackets. And they, they, so net had a free returns policy. 
They managed that by sending it back to a warehouse in Australia or whichever country it was, and then sea freighting, air freighting back into their supply chain. Um, so it really depends. The key is just asking and finding out from your uh, who you're buying from what the returns policy is. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it, it can be expensive. My, my workaround with Marks and Spencer was to claim it as damaged goods and, uh, and it was to do with sizing. So um, the, the description was damaged from my perspective and that worked a treat, <laughs> but uh, probably not something you can do many times over. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andrew, I have a question for you about um, uh, fulfillment out of a DC. Um, okay. Fulfillment out of a store is just not sexy and Countdown got a lot of publicity for setting up their dark stores and having, uh, you know, being seen as the cutting edge. So how does a retailer who doesn't have the scale and scope of, say, Countdown, uh, how, do they, how do they get any publicity and, and make, uh, make it seem like they're at the cutting edge, uh, even if they are fulfilling out of a store? Yeah, look, I... I I've, uh, oh God, must be 10 years now I've done presentations on store fulfillment versus DC fulfillment at conferences over the years. I, I think if you're M&S uh, in the UK and you're doing a billion dollars of sales online, it makes sense to spend $80 million on the distribution center and have a, uh, you know, and do DC fulfillment for online and, and carry the stock and pay for all that. The, the economics just don't add up. Uh, until you get to scale to do DC fulfillment from New Zealand. Um, you know, like um, even, even if the warehouse, uh, take the warehouse as a good example, 60,000 SKUs, you know, like even if they're doing a hundred million dollars online, they would need to set up a whole um, pick face for single replenishment in a DC that usually replenishes in cartons and inners. Uh, and pallets even uh, in a DC. That's a, that's a huge amount of space. Uh, it's uh, got seasonal stock and holding stocks another stocking location. You know, doing DCs just doesn't work with the volumes that we normally have in New Zealand, usually. Uh, and, and I'll take their examples where that does work. You know, uh, Kathmandu uh, would make sense because they ship all over the world. They already pick... Uh, each is in their distribution center in Melbourne and Christchurch, you know, and that, that may make sense for them. But for most retailers, uh, store fulfillment, where you already have the stock, you already have the space, you have store people, you can deal with uh, seasonality and, and clearance, which is often a big issue in that, in that managing each is, uh, is a much more sensible place to be doing it. And, and, uh, I think, yeah, it doesn't look sexy. Uh, it looks so much more sexy to be on the front page of retail news or whatever, the, you know, the AFR or something, talking about the massive investment that you've made in a new distribution center for online. But from a fundamental, that doesn't look good until later when our, you know, business is closing stores and, and heading into problems because they spent so much money on a new distribution center rather than driving the business from an online perspective and a growth perspective through what assets they've already got. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it, it is, and, and the, you know, a lot of supply chain people will tell you to pick from a distribution center, which drives me insane. Uh, and usually what they do is they talk about the picking cost and the cost to pick is cheaper in a distribution center than it is in a store, but you usually have to add in in a distribution center, space costs, fixed space costs, uh, fixed labor costs. There is labor that you can use in store, and no matter how many store managers tell you they're all fully utilized, there is an excess of labor time in stores usually you can utilize. There is stock already there. So that on the trade-off, you know, you end up you end up coming back to that um, question. And pretty much everybody in New Zealand is of the scale. Uh, where store fulfillment makes more sense. It also means you can be close to the customer and reduce lead times and freight costs too as well, of course, right? Mm. You know, um, and, and again, much easier to handle returns. Um, it's the classic marginal cost versus average cost yeah. problem in economics. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and and uh, a lot of retailers are using that network and using digital as part of that mix. You know, I've got a, a few examples. I can't talk about them, but a few examples where it wouldn't make economic sense really for them to open a store in Christchurch or South Island. But because they can do digital fulfillment for that proportion of the population that lives down there, adding a slightly larger stock room to that store in South Island, it makes more economic sense to have that store there, you know, you know or um, in Wellington, you know, usually it's Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch, right? It's usually the sort of fulfillment network that you'd start with in New Zealand. Yeah. Very good. Uh, we did have a question about drones from Alexei. Who would like to tackle that one? <laughs> uh, can, I, can I do my favourite joke first? That I've used the conference. <laughs> yeah, drone delivery will never fly. Um, you know, the, I think drones are a fantastic idea and uh, they, they physically make sense from a fulfilment perspective. Uh, the problem is legislation. And, and weight of packages. Uh, I, I, you know, like I, I had an argument once at a conference about three years ago with a guy from um, the Mexican food place, Guzman, Gazman or whatever it's called, um, about it because they were trialing drone deliveries. The problem, the problem is, is in, in built up areas where it would actually be really helpful uh, to have a lot of drone deliveries and take volumes out of the street and, and speed up delivery. Nobody's going to agree to hundreds of drones flying over the car, carrying boxes of goods. Uh, and the legislation requirements have got to catch up with that. And I think that's why it's, it's possible to do uh, tomorrow. And, and, you know, Amazon have tried it, DHL have tried it, everybody's tried it. But the actual use of it, other than maybe, you know, rural areas in Australia where it would be good if you could get drones that would go that far, uh, I think will take years to to, to happen. Uh, I mean, I think we'll 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 see. Um, you know, self-driving automated vehicles. I think before we'll see drone deliveries in central Auckland on any well, scale. I think it'll be one of those that's led by the really big operators, the really big business, if it ever literally takes off. Um, I think then others will come on board, but I. I would imagine I'll be long retired before we start seeing anything like that. Yeah. Andrew, I think you need to have a chat with your uh, mates from Torpedo 7 because as many a time I've been on some remote hike, you know, on the Kepler track or something and thinking a drone delivery of beer and pizza would be bloody awesome right now. <laughs> uh, and that's sufficiently remote, but uh, yeah, maybe... The yeah, look, drone, drones have got amazing applications. I, I, I used to be on the board of UNICEF for years and stuff. I, I think... Things like uh, drug delivery in Africa uh, and, and places like that where roads are difficult. There are amazing applications for drones, but I think for, you know, beer and pizza on the Kepler track, yeah, would be great if you could get a drone to go that far and you're prepared to pay the delivery charge. So your $5 pizza is probably gonna cost you about $70, I would have thought, just to get it there. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think the legislation requirements are just too tricky for a long time uh, for that to happen. I mean, yeah, my kids will see it. I'll see it probably, but I'll just I'll just be so old. I think I think it's five to ten years away probably. Uh, last question that I have is um, about uh, Andrew. Your comment about uh, being better, simpler, and cheaper. I totally agree with that as a as a strategic focus. But within retail, um, there's the, the classic model of the wheel of retailing, of the pressure to trade up. That over time, you add services, you add product, and you add cost as a way of uh, trying to compete uh, with others in the same sector. Um, those pressures are always there. And of course, we have periodic resets where someone will trade down quite deliberately uh, to go after lower cost. Uh, how do retailers, particularly small ones, um, how do they balance those pressures? I think the key for me has always been knowing what you're about. 
and um, you know, I, I like that. I, we've, we all know the warehouse, and we, um, and half of us work there, no doubt. The 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 warehouse was always about price and about bargains, and then it started adding range, you know, and it got to the point where. Yeah, there's always a customer for a different brand or a different color of item, you know, like there's always a customer for it, but does it make sense to actually sell it? You know, and you got to the point a few years ago, maybe five or eight years ago, where you go into the warehouse, look at the Manchester department, there'd be eight brands of Manchester, all with styles, colors and sizes that got to such a point that it was ridiculous and unable to shop. Meanwhile, Kmart, who used to be, who used to be high low, they used to be the competitor to uh, Big W in Australia and fail miserably. Everything was on discount for one weekend only. You know they'd do thirty percent off denim and all the rest of it. Kmart did a fantastic job and went the other way uh, with a limited range. They probably have no more than six to ten thousand SKUs now. There's one brand through the whole of home. They're very limited in width, and that enables them to deliver on their price promise, and it enables them to deliver a lot more easily on things like supply chain and, you know, uh, and store store labour cost and things like that. So I think I think for them it's it's about being understanding what you are, and understanding what your strategic advantage is, and that may change over time. But, uh, but, you know, a bit like my book that recommended the S model of retail, it's like it's understanding what it is that you're going to win on. You know, you can't be everything to everybody, although that's the temptation. And I see a lot of retailers do it. Um, you know, you could take pumpkin patch as an example, how they went out of business. Their product range got more and more flowery, more and more embroidery, more and more... You know, like you were going, hang on a minute, this was really good stuff with nice design that I would like my kids to wear. And eventually it got to the point where, you know, it was over engineered and the product didn't make sense for the price that they were charging, uh, as well as they were getting hammered by international who had better products and price for that as well. You know, so it's, it's understanding where you fit in the market and, and being true to that. And it may change over time. And being careful, and I think it relates to Mark's comment about what do you do in a crisis? You know, um, what do you do with your stock in a crisis? You focus on continuity lines and core lines and being in stock of those because that's what you're about. And you try and limit your exposure to risk. So I think if you're an apparel retailer coming into 20-odd uh, years here, I still don't know what's summer and winter, coming into... Um, summer over Christmas, you know, you'll, you'll be less uh, exuberant about what your seasonal apparel range is with the fear that there could be another, another lockdown in New Zealand and hence nobody selling stuff and hence you're going to have a massive clearance and a massive markdown. So it's that, it's that, yeah, knowing who you are instead of being true to that, I think is the key. Sorry, talk too much. No, fantastic. Um, conscious of time, so I'll, I'll give each of you sort of a, an opportunity for a last word. And I need to do something with the sun. That's just terrible. But anyway, I can't do anything about that. It's a lovely sunny day. Uh, Mark, you in first. So anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, one of the questions that was asked there was around um, how do you manage buffer stocks with the volatility of products right now? And um, we've definitely seen it in retail. Uh, we've seen it in, you know, within fresh food products. Uh, you've read in the news about flour and the unavailability of flour um, because supply just went through the roof. Now, I guess it really comes down to the type of retailer that you are, the perishability of the products. And this goes right back to the, what is your core lines? What are the must haves from a customer point of view that you absolutely don't want to be out of stock of? And if there is some volatility within that, then I would suggest that on those products you carry more. Um, but really work with your suppliers, understand the agility. And if they're domestic suppliers, great. Because if they, as long as they can get the materials, then you can work with them to get that product and get access to that product. If they're overseas, it's, it's a different proposition. And it really comes down to the products that you're selling. And if it's apparel, as a for example, you know, the reality is it's quite seasonal anyway. 
So once you've sold through, really you should be bringing new product through um, and selling that. So I think you've got to, it really does come down to just understand your business and understand your customer because there is going to be volatility right now um, and you just got to be able to react quickly. Fantastic. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, look, I, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, past five years, I've been to the conferences and everybody tells me that physical retail is dead and digital is taking over or that, uh, you know, that people are dead in stores and it's all going to be AI. I, I, think, I think the truth of the matter is, is that in times of uncertainty and times of difficulty, good retail wins and poor retail goes to the wall. And I think what is going to happen over the next six, 12 months globally and, and in New Zealand is, is that's just going to get speeded up because the pressure is coming on. Uh, and, uh, and the things that have been happening for the past few years are going to continue to happen, but at a faster pace. Mm. So digital is going to grow as a percentage of total retail faster than it has been growing. And, and if, you, if you haven't sorted that out and you haven't got investment in your flagship store, which is online, not on Pitt Street or Queen Street or wherever uh, the, day, the, the flagship stores are supposed to be these days is key. The other thing is mid-market retail and retailers who don't know who they are are going to disappear. You know, they're going to close. Mid-market apparel has been closing at a rate that, that's going and right sizing store networks is going to continue to happen so in the past when you needed 60 stores to cover new zealand you don't need 60 stores now with a digital presence that's going to speed up and unfortunately a lot of a lot of retail networks you're going to see people closing stores around the country and the other thing from a supply chain perspective is the same as always is is how do you manage the process take out cost but manage risk and with this and i think mark covered it and and jeff as well is um you know you're managing a time of risk supply risk uh, there will be a second wave of covid internationally definitely and that's going to affect supply uh there may or may not be in new zealand and, and, and you know that'd be fantastic if not uh but you've got to deal with with risk now and, and look at scenarios and make some key judgments about that. That's always been the case and it, and it still continues to be the case. So yeah, it's just um, doing retail better in a, in a tougher environment, which is continuation of the past five years, really. Yeah, I teach a course in uh, strategic transformation and retailing and that's the theme this whole semester has been that Retailing is dynamic and there have always been pressures. We just see a number of those pressures coming together all at the same time. Yeah. Challenging times, of course. Uh, Jeff, any final words? Uh, yeah, sure. Andy, Andy and Mark have covered off extremely well, actually. Uh, and I, all I'd say is just, um, I think uh, what, I, what I finished up with, you know, know, know your information, know your logistics, know your supply chain, understand your customer, understand their drivers and, 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 and what they need, uh, and uh, and just find ways to make your business that whole experience of doing business with you uh, so much better. Uh, and like I say, understanding your information, understanding your data, uh, and your final model, your supply chain, all the way through. Just understand what your customers are looking for, understand they have needs, and do what you can to meet those needs and tailor your business accordingly. Fantastic. Thank you all three for those wonderful comments uh, and your presentations and uh, not quite keeping to time, but all, we collectively we have smashed that, that target well and truly. Uh, thank you and uh, stay tuned next week for webinar seven on employment. Go well.